thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to go to that next verse in 1 John, and then it says, we should be called the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we don't look like we're going to look. We're, we're on our way. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, when we see him, we will be just like him. For we will see him as he is. Ooh, hallelujah. Just turn to somebody and say, God's working on it in my life. Just tell them, God's working on it in my life. Amen. God's working on it. All right, you may be seated. God bless you. How are you, Abundant Life? Oh, it is good to be in church, and it's good to be preaching the Word of the Lord today. Are you enjoying this amazing summer in central New York? It's so beautiful. Listen, we want to take a minute to greet not only all of you that are here, also watching in the Life Chapel on campus, but the many friends and family members who are watching all over central New York, uh, New York State, and around the country and different parts of the world. Uh, we've got folks watching from all these different areas in New York. I won't read them all. Uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Boston, Massachusetts, Baltimore, Maryland, welcome. Trenton, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, Denver, Colorado, welcome. Good to have you. Wichita, Kansas, I bet that's my aunt. Uh, Hartford, Connecticut, Nightdale, North Carolina, Augusta, South Carolina, Homosassa, Florida. Homosasa. Homosasa. <laughs> San Diego, California, and other places around the country and the world. Welcome. God bless you. We're so glad you're with us. Let's give a big shout out, those who are with us live. It's good to have you here. All right, how many of you brought a Bible? This is the Word of God. It is powerful, it is alive, and it has the ability to change your life. And we're here now. We've received the sacrament of his broken body and shed blood in Holy Communion. Now we're going to receive the sacrament of his word. Hallelujah. So hold your Bible over your head if you have one and just begin to praise God and thank God with me. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that it is living, it is powerful, and that everything you said in your word, you back up with yourself and with your power. Father, as we study the word today, as we open it up, guide our heart. Father, guide my mind, my lips speak through me. And Father, uh, Guide the ears of those who hear. Help us, whether we're here live or digitally in time or wherever we are in space, to hear the word of the Lord. Father, not just that which I intend, but that which you intend for us to hear today. For Father God, you have a plan for us. And Lord, it doesn't always make sense when we're in it. Sometimes we don't know what you're doing or how you're leading. But Father, I know this, that if we follow your spirit... And if we keep our hearts right, that, Lord, it all turns out well. You work all things together for our good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose. Help us to see this in the Word of God today as we study the amazing birth of your church at Philippi. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, open your Bibles this morning. We're going to jump right into it. I might talk a little fast this morning, but just uh, listen fast. Praise the Lord. Uh, take notes if you can, and let's jump into the Word of God. Philippians chapter 1. We've begun this book of Philippians. It's a four-chapter book. It's one of the most uh, brief and yet powerful books in the New Testament. It is unique in so many ways. Uh, the book of Philippians has some unique characteristics in that it's one of the only books in the New Testament or letters in which there's very little corrective material. Paul doesn't have a lot of 
corrections. He has guidance, he has warnings, but not corrections for problems in the church at Philippi. You find a very different situation when you come to Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Colossians. Uh, You find that Paul and even Peter are correcting things in the church. But when Paul writes to the Philippians, there's a tone that he has that's even more lifting than any of the other epistles. He knew them, he loved them, he speaks of them with such strong affection. This was, if not his favorite church, one of his very favorite churches. He loved the the book of Philippians. He loved the Philippian people, rather. And what's remarkable about this, and we'll visit this numerous times, Paul is writing this little four-chapter book from a prison in Rome in which he was being tried to see if he would live or die. Paul had no certainty in life at this moment. Paul was not in a pleasant place. And yet, even though Paul was in prison, even though he was suffering, he writes this letter that is filled with joy. The word joy or rejoicing or its root is found over 14 times in this little four-chapter letter. Not only as a, as a commandment for us to be joyful, but Paul expresses his joy even in the midst of his suffering. And we're going to find today that in this first few verses of Philippians chapter 1, Paul introduces us to the church, and he's going to make a statement that we're going to dive into. So let's take a look. Philippians chapter 1, and let's begin again at the first verse. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Now remember, there's five groups or individual persons that are introduced here. We have Paul and Timothy. They're mentioned first because they're actually writing this letter together. It's coming from both of them. And then it says, to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, that's the local church at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. We find that there's Paul, Timothy, and the church, and the church was made up of saints and leadership, and that leadership was divided into bishops. It's the Greek word episkopos, which means those who oversee. It refers to the office of the lead pastors or overseers of the church, and then you have the word deacons, which is the Greek word diakonos, which means ministers. These were those appointed by the pastors of the church, the overseers of the church, to care for the needs of the saints. So we have In a local church, believers and leaders. Believers aren't called to be the leaders, and the leaders aren't to try to just be believers. A local church, any good local church, will not just have a collection of equals. It will have within the believers some who are called and specially gifted and anointed to lead as chief servants of the local church. Every healthy Christian should be a member of a visible local church that is led by overseers and deacons. If you don't have those who are over you, you are out of order in the New Testament church. There is no such thing as a Christian living a free-willing YouTube Christianity life. There is no such thing in the Bible as a Christian living out of connection from a vital, known relationship within a local assembly where they are known and know others and where there are spiritual leaders appointed to teach them, to guide them, and to serve them. And if you're not in that structure, the first thing we know about church, it's not just a group of believers hanging out and reading the Bible together. What did you get? This is what I got. That's not a church. That's a Bible study. A church has believers under the authority structure of bishops and deacons who are there to lead and guide the church and serve them. And it's very important, especially in this day and age where the church has been redefined to the point that we have lost the understanding of what a local church is. Paul is very clear in the beginning of this letter that he and Timothy, who we'll find were the starters, the pioneers, the apostles who began the church at Philippi, are now writing to the church as an independent organization. And it's made up of saints with bishops and deacons that were appointed by Paul to lead, guide, and serve the flock. Hallelujah. If, you don't, if, you're, not in a, if you're a Christian and you're not in a church system that has some leadership, you need to find one. Amen. Amen. Now notice he goes on to say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Standard greeting, grace and peace. Uh, You'll notice at our church a lot of times we'll speak grace and peace 
to you and, and to one another. It was the standard New Testament greeting. Grace is God's favor that forgives your sins, that enables you to stand before Him holy and enables you to receive from Him His blessings. Peace is the result of a life that is lived in unity with Jesus Christ and in worship of Him. And when you live in Christ and you live in a revelation of grace, you can have both favor and peace. Hallelujah. Paul begins by saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. Now, we're not going to dive into this too much. I just want you to capture this. Verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the, say it with me, from the first day until now. Now, we're going to stop there for today. He said, I thank my God every time I think of you, always, in every prayer. I'm always thinking about you. I'm always thanking God for you. And I'm always making requests, which means Paul prayed for them. He asked God to do things for them. And he said, and I do it with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. So let's just... We're getting a timeline here, and I'm, I'm going to try my best not to get ahead of myself because I could really get into this, but we're going to follow it along, okay? So Paul is thanking God for the Philippians, and he talks about the first day. This word first means the day it began, the beginning day, until now. Now, we know by uh, dating this letter that Paul was writing between 10 and 12 years after he first met the Philippian church. And since we have in this opening letter, Paul, Timothy, and the Philippians, it's good to go back and see how they met. Because when Paul talks about, I thank God when I think of you from the first day till now, he wasn't just referring to some idea of the moment that he heard about them, he was there on their first day. So we want to go back in this service and take a look at the first day. Now, before we do, I want to say this to you, it's really important. There are two important days in your life, many many more, but two essential days. One is the day that you're born. In that day, your spirit is given a body, and you are, through your parents, given life, time, talent, treasure, and opportunity. And thus begins your journey in the earth life in which you will be held accountable as a steward for what you do with what you've been given and what you do with what you come to know. And the day that you checked in is a very important day. Would you agree? But there is a more important day than the day of your birth. And that is the day that you're born again. The second most important day is not when you're born to physical life, but when your spirit is reborn to eternal life. Jesus came on the scene and spoke to a very religious man named Nicodemus, and he said to him, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Everybody say born again. Nicodemus said, what, have I got to become a baby again, get back in my mother's womb and be born? Natural, natural response. He said, no, no, I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You see, when you're born of your parents, you're physically born. Your body is born. But when you're born of the Holy Spirit, you are born spiritually. Your heart gets a new beginning. And the Bible tells us that when a man or woman hears the message of Jesus and for themselves believes it from their heart, they experience a powerful and permanent and pervasive change within their constituent anatomy. That literally, being saved is not just walking to an aisle, getting your name written down in heaven or on a roll. It's literally, if you're really saved, God says that he reaches down on the inside of you 
he removes from your core being, your spiritual essence, the root of sin, and he makes you a saint in your spirit, and he gives you a new birth. Your spirit becomes new. Now, that doesn't mean everything in your life is perfect. You still have a body. You still have a brain. Your brain doesn't get born again. Your body doesn't get born again, but your spirit gets born again, and that's your first day. Even though you may be fully grown, you may be an older person physically, you may be older in your thinking, when you're born again, you are a babe in Jesus Christ. Oh, can we just take a minute? Just go over, just go over real quick to uh, the book of 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 1. And look with me in verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Notice what he said. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So when a person hears the word of God about Jesus and they believe it, they become born again, and it says of an incorruptible seed. The Greek word is sperma, literally the DNA of God himself, the seed of God. Gives birth to a new spirit in you. This is so important. This is the biggest deficit in Christianity today is a loss of the revelation of regeneration. When a person is saved, they don't just decide to be Christian or follow. It's not just a decision for Christ. A literal miracle occurs. Certainly your decision is involved. You surrender your life to Christ. You believe on him. But when that happens, there is a very real supernatural miracle that occurs. The Bible says that God's own seed comes into your spirit and recreates your spirit and it remains in you and you are now a child of God. Spiritually, your spirit is born of God. The nature of sin, the nature of Satan is removed. You have a brand new spirit. So people who are truly born again are really new people in their spirits. But we don't get new brains, so all of our problems and feelings, you know, we've got to work those out. That's called sanctification. All right? Our bodies, you know, they don't get changed. We still have struggles with the same things we did before, physically, the same temptations. But now you've got a winning combination. You've got the Holy Spirit in your born-again spirit. And if you will now study the Word of God, your, your mind can begin to think like your spirit is, and you can win over your flesh. Amen. Which is why he goes on to say this. Notice in, uh, in uh, the end of verse uh, 25, It says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Everybody say the word of the Lord. See, the word of the Lord is preached, you believe it, and you're born again of the incorruptible sperm of the word of God. God's own word gives birth to a new spirit. Verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1. Now, notice this. Therefore, he's talking to born again people, therefore, lay aside all malice deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Did you know you can be a Christian and still struggle with malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking? Right? He wouldn't tell you to lay it aside if you didn't have to sometimes lay it aside. You see, we're still going to be tempted with those things. So now that we're born again, we've got to know that we're born again. And now we have to lay those things aside. I love the way he talks about it. Lay it aside. It's not part of your life anymore. One translation said, strip it off. And what do we do? Verse 2. Read it out loud as what? Okay. New born what? Babes. In the, in the previous verse, it says you're born again by the word of the Lord, the word that's preached to you, the incorruptible seed of the word of God that lives and abides forever. Now he's saying, now that you're born again, you're a newborn babe, lay aside the behaviors of, of, of immaturity, and as newborn babes, what? Read it with me. Desire the pure milk of the word that you may what? Grow. Oh, this is important. How does a person get saved? Because of great music? Nope. Because they went to a beautiful building? Nope. 
because they were raised in a Christian home? Nope. You're not, you're not saved because your parents were saved. You're not saved because you went to church and Sunday school. See, you have to believe the word of the Lord. There has to be a point, you may not remember if you were raised in church, but there has to be a point where you, from your heart, believe that Jesus died, not just historically, but vitally for your sins. That he, and you surrender your life to him as, as your Lord and Savior. And then you become born again. And now, how do we change? How do we lay aside these sins? How do we grow up as a newborn babe, desire the pure milk of the word? Just like a baby needs milk, a newborn babe needs milk. What are you, what's the milk that the babies need? What is the milk that believers need to grow? The word of the Lord. The same thing that saves you is the thing that grows you up. He didn't say his newborn babes desire uh, to take communion on a regular basis. Communion's wonderful, but it won't grow you up. It's a powerful sacrament and imparts grace, but it is not to replace the Word of God. He didn't say his newborn babes desire prayer meetings. Prayer is powerful. It helps you to know God. It releases his power in the earth. But prayer alone won't grow you up. He didn't say his newborn babes, praise and worship Jesus all day. Praise and worship is wonderful, but you're not any more mature or spiritual after you've praised and worshiped than you were before. That's not what God designed. He didn't put the power for your sanctification in worship. He didn't put the power of your sanctification in good works. You can do good works. They're wonderful. They can help you to grow. It's not in fellowship. This is the big thing of this, our generation. Everybody wants fellowship, community, community. We, have, we, have, we talk about community more than anything else, and, we have, and people are more lonely by every statistical measure than they've ever been before. Thank God for fellowship. We need one another. It's essential. It's important. But you can have all the great fellowship in the world. You can be close to people. You can have great community, relationships, connections, love God, love one another. But if somebody, if somebody isn't feeding you the Word of God, if you are not eating the Word, you can have the best praise in town. You can have the best small groups in town. You can have fun all day long and still be a baby in 10 years. The only thing this church has to offer you, to cause transformation in your life is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Not illustrations, not nice little stories, <clears throat> not plays, not concerts. All those things are fine. But boy, we better make sure if we're doing one thing, we're feeding on this book. And if you go to this church and you don't know the word, you're not getting into the word yourself, we failed you, you failed you. You need this word in your heart. It's the only thing that will cause you to grow as a newborn babe. Desire, hunger for, crave the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. At the end of the day, I can offer you all kinds of things, but if I don't give you the word, I've not helped you, not really. I can encourage you, give you some hope, tell you a sweet story, make you feel better. But your life's not changing until you hear and act on the word. The first day is the day you're born again. But now, you've got to grow. You've got to grow. And there's a lot of folks that get, give their lives to Christ at the first day, but because either they're not focused on the Word, they're not taught the Word, or the Word is mistaught or misapplied, they stay in a babyhood stage. That's why we must hunger for the Word. We shouldn't zone out when it's time to teach the Word. As, as important as everything is that's happened today, and all of it's essential and wonderful, now we come to the sacrament of the Word, the one thing that can transform our lives. Are you following me? He said, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. So we all have a first day, the day that we actually begin our journey in Christ, the day we're born again. Sometimes, so I don't know the date I was born again. I was kind of raised in church. Listen, you may not know, but, but I guarantee you there was a moment at some point where what you heard became real to you, where you, 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 you released faith in it and, and your spirit was regenerated. And, and uh, I think it's good when people are raised in church and they serve the Lord their whole lives and maybe they don't even know. They don't have a big life of sin to be saved from. That's a wonderful thing. But most of us can point to a moment in time where we know something changed. 
we were in a crisis or we were in trouble or what usually it comes because we're miserable and we hear the good news and we reach out to Jesus and something changes. That's the first day. And Paul said, I thank God for you always in every prayer of mine with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now, 10 years I've known you. 10 years. Let's take a look at how he knew them. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We're fortunate to have a detailed history written by Dr. Luke, who traveled with Paul, about how the Philippian church began. Now notice in the first couple of verses we have Paul, Timothy, and the Philippians, right? All of them are introduced in Acts chapter 16, even Timothy. So we're going to skim through this or, or, or read through this. I want you to take a look with me in Acts 16. Now before we do this, I'm, can you just handle one more thing? I'm going to use a map. How many love maps? All right, this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. What we have here is what's known as the Greek Peninsula. Actually, historic Greece was here. This was an area called Macedonia, very, uh, a, great, a great nation, a great empire at one time. And this is what we call today Turkey. But in the time of Paul, it was known as Asia Minor or Asia, okay? And on this side of the Mediterranean Sea, you'll see uh, this is basically Israel here, all right? And you'll see Jerusalem. And everything that Jesus did, he did basically in this region right here. All of his ministry took place there. Now, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he gave them a commission. He said to them in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, that's north of there, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, start where you are, go to your neighbors, and then I want you to take this message all around the world. Well, eight years later, they were still in Jerusalem. They hadn't taken it much of anywhere. So a persecution arose. And that persecution caused Christians to begin to spread to different places because they had to leave Jerusalem. Some of them ended up way up here in a place that we call Antioch in Syria. Can you see that, Antioch? And when the gospel came to Antioch, it was predominantly Gentiles who accepted the gospel. Now, most of the Christians for the first 10 years of the church were Jewish. There were some Gentiles that came in, but for the most part, they were focused on evangelizing their brethren. Uh, the Jewish people, even when they went outside of Israel, they were looking for the Jewish synagogues and, the, and, and those in the diaspora. They were looking to convert uh, Jewish people to receive Jesus as their Messiah. But in Antioch, we had this interesting situation where the vast majority of the people are Gentiles. Without going into a long story, the Apostle Paul is called by God in Acts chapter 9, and after about 13 years, he ends up in Antioch. And Antioch becomes the church from which the rest of the Gentile world, at least the Roman world, was evangelized. And Paul is there in Antioch, and he is a prophet, he is a teacher, and in Acts 13, he becomes an apostle. As they were praying, this was a large church, and the, the pastors and the, or the prophets and the teachers were praying and seeking the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work unto which I have called them. And so after they had prayed, they laid hands on Barnabas and Paul, and they sent them, they became apostles. The word apostle, apostolos, means to be sent or a sent one. So they actually entered into the office of the apostle in Acts 13. And so they traveled, Paul and Silas and a, a fellow named Mark, uh, also known, called John Mark, um, who previously had been a streaker on the night that Jesus was arrested, he ran naked in the garden. 
Read all about it in the Gospel of Mark. First streaker was John Mark. Uh, Now he's up in Antioch, and he joins Paul and Silas. And so they travel to this place called Cyprus. Uh, They have some ministry here. They run into some demonic things. Mark freaks out and runs back to Antioch. Paul and Silas then continue on. And let's just see if we can... Let me just do this. All right. So Paul and Silas uh, end up coming up here to this area. Notice it says Galatia. When you see in your Bible the book of Galatians, that is not to a specific individual local assembly. It's to all of the churches that Paul and Silas started in their first missionary adventure. So it's to all the churches. So Paul, he ministers in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, kind of comes back, and he starts churches. Those are the four main churches that Paul starts, and you can read all about it in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And after they had finished starting these churches, Paul and Silas go, whoops, well, Somehow this moved down. All right. Paul and Silas go back to Antioch. (laughs) All right. And in Antioch, they have an issue. They find out that the Christians down in Jerusalem are really upset that these churches are filled with Gentiles um, who are worshiping God and have not been circumcised and don't follow any Jewish laws. So the whole 15th chapter of Acts is the first church council. Paul and Silas get called down to Jerusalem, and they have a big trial in Jerusalem. Not a trial like a negative thing, but they're like, "What? Tell us what happened." And Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas, tell them. Paul and Barnabas, rather, tell them all about the people that were converted and how God had moved. And they decide, okay, okay, we'll allow Gentiles to be saved. Um, Kind of. Racial privilege is not just an American thing. And so uh, it's hard. It's hard. Tradition and religious tradition, ethnic tradition, very hard to break. And so uh, they say, yes, we're going to accept them as Christians. And so Paul and Barnabas come back, yay, hallelujah, they're very excited. And then they go, uh, they decide... And you can see it at the end of chapter, uh, <clears throat> just real quick look at chapter 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And uh, there was a little issue. We won't go into it. Let's just say there was a big fight between Paul and Barnabas over Mark. Because Barnabas wanted to take Mark, and Paul said, "Uh uh-uh, leave me once, burn me once, I'm a fool, burn me twice, no, whatever it is, you're a fool, you know what I mean. I'm not doing, I'm not doing the Mark thing. So, uh, it says in verse 39 that the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and Barnabas took Mark and sailed to uh, Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. So they split up. And notice, <clears throat> Mark had to go right back to where he filled the last test. <laughs> but Paul gets Silas, who we find out in chapter 15, is a prophet. And if you see these blue lines, that's where they went next. So they went to Derby and Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, to all those churches they started, and they gave them the, the, the Jerusalem results, you're officially Christians. You can be accepted. You don't have to get circumcised. How, can you imagine all those Gentile men that were so happy to hear that? They didn't. And then, <clears throat> and so, but I want you to notice this. So they've done that, but now they're, th- this is what I want you to hear. They had to find the will of God. And I'm going to say something. You want to know how to build a church? Learn how to follow the Holy Spirit. Today, there's so much emphasis on the pragmatics and the practicals and the structures and the organizational 
details. And there's nothing wrong with knowing that, but at the end of the day, unless God builds a house, you're going to labor in vain to build it. A great church is a church that's founded on the Word of God and the authority of Scripture and the leading and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And so Paul is a church starter, and he's now looking for something to do. And he's all the way here in Antioch, and so he starts seeking the will of God. Now notice this in verse 6, Acts 16, 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they'd come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Now let's just take a look at this. So they start walking this way, and uh, Paul really wants to go into Asia. And I'm telling you, he's got his eyes on this. Paul wants to get to Ephesus, major city of the first world, where the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place in all of Paul's ministry. So Paul would like to go there. But notice what it says. I love the language here. It says, uh, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. The Holy Spirit said no. Now, how did he do that? He did it by a, a witness. They just knew it didn't seem right in their spirit. Maybe they were praying and a prophetic word came forth. But the Holy Spirit inside of them said, no, it's not time. Don't go into Asia. That's not what I have for you. And then so they said, okay. And notice, so then they try to go up here to Mysia. They want to go north. And it says the Holy Spirit forbade them. He said, no, you can't go there either. And so then they just kept kind of walking west. And as they're walking along here, whoops, this thing keeps showing up. Uh, they come, I'm going to shrink this back down, okay, they come here to this place called Troas. So that's quite a walk, isn't it? Several hundred miles, uh, about 300 miles from Antioch to Troas. And, and you're walking by foot 300 miles, that would be like walking to, well, halfway down Long Island from Syracuse through New York to Long Island. It's quite a distance. So, <clears throat> and I want you to notice they're finding the will of God. The first step to starting a church is you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something, Christian. Being led by the Holy Spirit is a process. It's not just sitting down and waiting for a vision from heaven or asking some prophet to come and tell you what to do with your life. I believe in the gift of prophecy. I thank God for New Testament prophets. But nowhere in the Bible are we told to allow prophets to guide us. It says in the book of, uh, the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit can guide you. You can learn how to listen to your own born-again spirit. You can learn how to hear God for yourself. Thank God for the guidance that can come from prophets or from pastors or people who pray. And thank God for confirmations. But you should never put a person in the place of your ability to hear the Holy Spirit for yourself. Are you listening to me? This is really important. I could get into some things right now, but I, I just, just I, I'm not going to. <laughs> Many people's lives have been shipwrecked because... They put a prophetic person or a prophetic gift on a pedestal. The New Testament doesn't place it. And they put all their eggs in a basket based on a prophetic word, not on what God said to them. And, 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 they have, and often their lives get into shipwreck. You've got to be very careful about that. If you hear a word from God, the Bible says don't throw it out. Test it. See if it's true. But you're not supposed to build your life around a prophecy. Not a prophecy from me either. Are you listening to me? If I give a word, if I say this is what I feel the Spirit is saying, or if I give a message, I may give it strong. I typically say, now if it doesn't bear witness with you, don't accept it because I mean it. I could miss God because I can. But you need to take whatever prophecy you hear and you need to pray about it and see if it lines up with the word and then let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what to do. Are you following me? <clears throat> so, and I want you to see, here's Paul and here's Silas and, and Silas is a prophet. 
And, and he hears from God, and they're still trying to figure out the will of God. And this is what the Lord told me to tell you in this service today. There are some of you that are sitting here. There are some of you that are watching or listening later in time, and you are trying to find the will of God, and you are confused. It looked like this was the way, and the door closed. Then it looked like this was the way, and the door closed. And then you started walking in this way, and you were convinced it was God, and it doesn't feel right. It just doesn't seem right. And you don't know which way to go. Listen, sometimes that happens. That happened to Paul and Silas. They said, let's go to Asia. They're on their way. And as they go, the Holy Spirit says, no, okay. So they start going north. Well, and then the Spirit of God said, nope, you can't go there. Not yet, not now. And then you think, well, then he'd say, this is where I want you to go. No. He's playing a game of uh, hide and seek. Keep knocking on the doors. Keep lifting up the couch cushions. You'll find it eventually. And here's the thing, we want God to give us the word, and then we want to have an easy place of finding it. We just want to find the right job, we just want to find the right college, find the right house, find the right, we want everything to just lay out in front of us, and I'm going to tell you something, that kind of thinking is going to get you in trouble. Because sometimes in life, you do get a direction from the Lord, you do have a wind at your back, it is clear, and, and, and it's wonderful, you just sail through. But a lot of times in life, it's not clear. The doors are shut, and you got to go knocking. Maybe the first three jobs you had, they just somebody gave you a reference and you were hired. You didn't even have to interview, or things just came easy. Listen, if that happens your whole life, there's coming a moment where it's not going to come easy. There's coming a moment where you're not going to have a vision or a prophecy, and an angel with a fiery sword appear to you and say, Do this. Go to this college, accept this job. You're going to have to just walk some things out. It feels like, I think, I, I like this. I think this might be it. Go and, go and see it. Does it feel right? Well, it might feel right. I'm not sure. You know, it, but, and, and sometimes you pursue it and the door closes. Okay, that wasn't it. So maybe it's something over here. Sometimes you're seeking it out. You're seeking it out. Before we started this church, my wife and I were convinced we were supposed to go to Colorado. We had an opportunity to go on a, a church staff of a great church in Colorado, Colorado um, in Longmont, Colorado. And all the, we were, it was just looked like it was God. And uh, we had resigned from the church we were, we were a part of and, and believing that that was the, the, the way we were going to go. It was right to resign from the church we were a part of. Our time was up there. But it made it easier knowing my wife being about five months pregnant at the time, that there'd be something we'd go to. Right after we resigned from our, from our position, uh, and we did it with honor, uh, but we got a phone call from that pastor. He said, you know, I was praying, and in my spirit, I just don't feel like it's right. I said, you what? <laughs> he said, John, it doesn't seem right in my spirit. I don't know why. God has something else for you. Okay. All right, love you, <laughs> and he hangs up. So, <clears throat> but you know what? You know what? Here's the thing. It put, I was confused, but you know what? It was God, and we just said, okay, that's not the direction. Something else is. You think it's Asia. You think it's Mycenae. You think it's Bithynia. You think it's this. You think it's that. You go down there, but it just doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. And so what happens when you're moving in a direction and you find out, no, you go back to, you just kind of go back to where you were. And then you find out what's next. Well, this is what Paul and Silas are doing. And I want you to notice it didn't happen in two or three days. It's, it's easily a, another 100 miles, you know, from Troas to this area where they were making these decisions. They finally get up there to Troas, which is where Troy is. And I've been there. I, we led a tour there uh, 10 years ago. It's wonderful. Uh, I, I won't get into it. This is, this is a phenomenal site. This was the place where Paul received the Macedonian call. And so I want you to see what happens. Do uh, you think I need some tea? Is that... You're going to inter interrupt my teaching. It better be good tea. That's all I got to say. <clears throat> it's good tea. All right. <laughs> all right, come on. We got to look at this. So... <clears throat> Passing by Mycenae, they came to Troas, verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, I'm so glad that Paul followed his spirit. And, and, and eventually, they got really clear direction. I mean, he had a dream in the night. He sees a man dressed in Macedonian garb, he recognized it, and saying, come over and help us. And that's how they knew this is the will of God. Sometimes the will of God is something you see, not something you hear. And so, you know, they sail across here, <clears throat> the Aegean, and they come to Neapolis, which is the, the port city, and they go right to the capital city of the region, Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony, not just a Macedonian city. About uh, 80 to 90 years before this event, there had been a, a war. Uh, basically, Julius Caesar's armies were defeated, and the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire outside of Philippi. And so the Roman Empire, you know, was a radical change in the way government was structured, and Philippi became very famous for this reason. There were a lot of retired military from that war that were living in Philippi and their descendants and children. They were very proud to be a part of Rome. Not only that, but Philippi was founded by Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. Philip of Macedon poured into Alexander his vision for greatness, and so it was an ancient, very, very powerful city with a lot of prestige. Paul goes to a city that's going to have a big impact, and when he gets there, this is what's so amazing, and we don't have a lot of time to look at it, so we're just going to have to go quick. Paul goes down by a river. There wasn't any synagogue he could start with. It was his tradition to start in the synagogues and share Christ. But he goes down to a river, and there's a couple of Jewish women who were reading the scriptures on the Sabbath, and there was a Gentile woman named Lydia who was listening, a very wealthy merchant. And so Paul sat down. I love this. He just sits down with them and just begins sharing Christ with these women. What's interesting, there's no record of the Jewish women receiving Jesus, but this Gentile woman, Lydia, this wealthy woman, her heart is opened by the Lord, and she accepts Christ. And so their first convert becomes this very powerful, wealthy woman. And then she invites Paul and Silas, and Timothy is with them now. We didn't get to talk about that, but they picked up Timothy, and invites them to stay at their house and to begin teaching in the house. So the first church, the first church meetings in Philippi took place at Lydia's house. And we know it was a purple church because she sold purple she might even have had a purple roof on the top of her house. We don't know. <laughs> and the Spirit of God begins moving and great things start happening. And you can read all about it in the rest of Acts chapter 16. Paul begins preaching openly on the streets. People are getting saved. And this one little servant girl who was, who was a fortune teller, a slave, really a, a uh, n not so much a sex slave as much as a, uh, an occult slave. Uh, she starts crying things out, and Paul and Silas uh, put up with it for a while, and eventually Paul realizes that this girl has got a demonic entity, rebukes the demon, and the demon leaves, and this little servant girl gets saved. So two of the biggest converts mentioned in Philippi, a wealthy woman and a servant girl. They become the foundation stones of the church. Well, when the people who had, were taking this little girl around to give her prophecies realized she couldn't prophesy by the devil's power anymore, they got really upset, and they stirred up a crowd, and they said, these men are violating our Roman ways, and they had Paul and Silas beaten with rods, which meant typically in the ancient world their feet would be hit with metal bars until they were bruised and or broken. And then they put their feet in stocks, which would have been particularly painful, and put them in the inner prison, the Roman, uh, the Roman prison, in which case they'd be tried to, either to be killed or to be let go. And the Bible tells us, and we know this story about midnight, Paul and Silas are in the middle of the prison and they start singing praises to God. 
Now, they had done the right thing, but the wrong thing happens. How many of you have done the right thing? You followed the Holy Spirit. You did what he told you to do. You went and you finally got the will of God. And it seems like it's a really small thing. Only a couple of people are responding. It doesn't really blow up right away. And, and the people are responding are, 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 are these, these, you know, the, these two women who in that society would not have had a lot of power. But yet God's giving him fruit. He's giving them fruit. You know, don't judge the fruit. Thank God for the fruit. And then you do the right thing and the wrong thing happens. You ever had that happen? You tell the truth and you get fired. Uh, You don't cheat on your taxes and you get audited. (laughs) You, You know, you do something right and the wrong things happen. Listen, that happens sometimes. The devil comes because you do the wrong thing, but he also comes because you do the right thing. But here's the great news. Paul and Silas were not so connected to the trials and the pain and the disappointment that they weren't able to worship Jesus. And so they begin worshiping God in the middle of the night, and everybody hears them. That means they're, they're you know, guaranteed they're singing things about Jesus. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that praise and worship, the, 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 the Bible says that the jail was shaken by God, and Paul and Silas's bonds are freed, and everybody else in the prison is freed. See, your praise has an impact not just on you, but on other people too. Sometimes God's waiting for you to praise in the middle of your pain so that other people can be set free from their pain. And then the jailer of the Philippian place, he, he comes to Paul and says, this, he says, what must I do to be saved? He's, he, now he's convicted. And so you now have a Roman centurion getting saved and his whole house gets baptized. I mean, you, see, you never know how God's going to use something. You might be in a job right now. You might think, this is beneath me. This is not what, I, what I'm called to do. This is not my ultimate thing. Listen, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Be a good steward of what you have. Don't let social media get you in discontent and the fear of missing out so that you're not living in the life that you have now with the people God has given you now, with the joy that's available to you now, because you're not somewhere else. You are where you are. God is with you where you are. Be a good steward of your life now. Be a good steward of your time now. Be a good steward of your voice, of your prayer. Just start where you are and see what God can do. After Paul gets broken out of prison, uh, Paul takes off. He can't can't stay there. He's got to move on. But that was how he began meeting the Philippians. Paul and Silas and Timothy and the Philippians all got their start together on that second missionary journey. And that little church started supporting Paul from the first day. They took, we'll read, we'll read later in the New Testament, they took offerings for Paul, they helped him, and they grew, and they were blessed of the Lord. They went through trials and tribulations, but they were steadfast. Because, listen, they weren't following God for the benefits They weren't following God just to see if things would go well. They knew that there were trials and tribulations. Paul Paul was writing from prison, but they first met Paul when he was being put in prison for the first time. And they had learned something, that your joy does not depend on your circumstances. Your joy depends on Jesus. And whether you're trying to figure out what God wants for you, just keep moving, keep moving. If the door closes, say, okay, that's not it. Find it. Keep going. You're going to eventually hear God. No one ever deeply desiring to hear and follow God will ever find anything else. If that's really in your heart, to follow God's will, you will find the will of God. And if you come up against barriers and you come up against opposition and you, you do the right thing and the wrong thing happens, listen, Welcome to being a child of the Lord. (laughs) That's part of it. Bad things happen no matter what. The great news is if you stay on track with God, if you keep worshiping Him, if you keep your focus, you keep your mind fixed on Him, as Paul's going to write later in this letter, it's amazing how God can turn it around for you and I. It all starts when you give your life to Jesus. The first day, the first day, the first day, begins a journey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's thank God for his word today. We give you praise, Father. We thank you. Thank you for your word, Father. Hallelujah. We bless you. We honor you. Father, I thank you so much for the word of the Lord. Father, I thank you 
that, uh, Lord, all those that are with us today, those who are watching, those who are present, Father God, we're living in times that are uncertain. We're living in times of disruption. We're living in times where many are afraid. But, Father, we thank you that because we know Jesus, we don't have to be afraid. That, Father, we have a a secure and a safe place in you. And so, Father, today, if we've allowed circumstances, if we've allowed confusion, if we've allowed persecution to distract us from the opportunities that lie before us, forgive us, Father. Lord, let us lay aside our pride and let us recognize that you are with us right now. There's nothing we can't do through Christ who gives us the strength. That, Lord God, You are calling us, not just to be saved, but to serve you, to be disciples in your word, to grow so that we can see your power and your glory in our lives and in our generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I pray in particular for those who are frustrated because they have not been able to find exactly what the will of God is. Give them hope to know that if they include you in their search, you will guide them. You are with them. Hallelujah. Say this out loud. I will fulfill the will of God for my life. Say it again. I will fulfill the will of God for my life. I will not allow delays, detours, depression, discouragement to keep me from pressing on. I give him praise for that right now. Just give him praise. Those of you that are watching online, we're going to throw you to the post to the post uh, conversation. Thank you for being with us today. I want to talk to you that are here right now. And if you're here today, you've heard this message from God's word. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're sitting here today and you'd say, you know, I don't know that to die today, I'd go to heaven. This is live television, everybody. (laughs) We're going to go back to the sanctuary, hopefully in a minute here. Snatch you out of darkness into light. And it begins with you accepting what God gave you, which is Jesus, accepting this gift. Jesus came into this world as a gift of God for you so that he could live the perfect life that you and I can't live and that he could go to the cross and die for sins that we can't pay for. And if we just simply accept that gift of Jesus, God's Son, and we receive his Son, the Bible says, as many as receive Jesus, to them, God gives the power to be his children. That's just a simple thing, receiving Jesus into your life, saying, Lord, I'm not going to try to to be the boss of my life anymore. I'm going to surrender my life to you. And if you're ready to do that today, God is ready to save you. He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to cleanse you. And I'm telling you, it'll be the first day of the rest of your life. If you're here today and you say, Pastor John, I don't know that I'm a Christian. I don't know if I was to die if I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I'm born again. I want to pray for you right now. Would you lift your hand all over this place? Lift your hand. God bless you. Are there others that would lift their hands? Say, I don't know that I'm a Christian. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Be bold. Lift your hand. You might say, I I don't know if I was to die, if I'd go to heaven. If that's you, if that is how you're feeling, listen. I want you to lift your hand. I want to pray for you today, right now. Hallelujah. There may be some other folks that are here today, and you'd say, Pastor, uh, I've been a Christian. I've given my life to Christ, but I am not living for him like I should. There are some things in my life that I have taken back, and I, am, I need to surrender again my life to Christ. I need to come back to God. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand right now. This is a moment for you. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Okay. We're going to say a prayer. I want you to do something. And it's going to be a, it's, it's a bold thing, but I want you to do it right now. I want to pray for you. I have something I want to give to you to help you in your walk with God. And we're going to take care of this right now in the presence of the Lord. Right now. 
as a man, as a woman of God, we're going to stand up and take responsibility, and we're going to come and seek the Lord. I want to invite you, if you lifted your hand for any reason, or should have lifted your hand and didn't, I want you to stand up where you are right now, and I want you to come and meet me right here at this altar. We're going to say a prayer today, and we're going to get this right with God. Come on. Wherever you are, come on. That's it. Come on. Thank you. Bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Amen. There's others that lifted their hands or should have. I know it in my spirit. Come on. Let's get this right with God today. Come on. If you need to be down here, you need to be down here surrendering your life to Jesus. Come on. Let's get it. This is your first day. First day. Bless you. Bless you. All right, the altar is still open. We're going to say a prayer right now. This is a powerful prayer. The Lord loves you so much. He alone knows all that you've been through, all that you're feeling, all that you're facing. But the one thing God wants you to know right now is he loves you. Hey, everybody. So sorry about the little faux pas earlier. Pastor John said we're going to go live. We didn't know he was going to say that. So we went live when we weren't, we weren't ready. But now we're ready. So, hey, everybody, I'm so glad you guys got to watch service with us. We're so glad you're here with us today. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, if you accepted Jesus for the first time, if you've made a decision for Christ, or maybe you made a decision to rededicate your life to Christ, we want to know about it. We want to know if you've decided to become a new creation, as this shirt says. Let one of our online hosts know, or you can always email us at info at alcclife.org. That's info at alcclife.org. If you email us and let us know of your decision, we will follow up with you. Another way to do it is if you go to abundantlife.church forward slash get involved. At the very top of that page, there is a connect card. If you fill that out and you put in the notes that, that you made a decision for Christ today or whatever you want to do. Maybe you didn't make that decision, but you still want to connect with us. That card is the way, is your gateway to connect with our church. We encourage you, fill that out. We want to talk to you. We say this almost every single week here. We don't want this to be a one-way relationship where you just watch and you don't talk with us. We want to talk with you. We want to get to know you. We want you to be a part of this amazing body. So I really hope you enjoyed the service today, that you got all the nutrients out of learning about Paul's journey to Philippi, what brought him here, all the things that went into that, about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus. These are the things that we're studying in this book of Philippians, so I encourage you, read the book over and over again. This is how we get the word in us. We read it, we meditate on it. We read it, we meditate on it, we chew on it. And when you come to the services and we learn about each chapter and each section as we go through it, it's not unfamiliar territory to you if you're reading it yourself. So you're reading it, you bring your own understanding, your own revelation, and then we're going to help you break down that what your revelation is versus what God's revelation in, is in it and with the intent of the author and all of those things. So I encourage you to read yourself. The Word of God is living and it is powerful and is, it is for you and it is for me. We don't just get the Word by sitting in church and listening to someone else read it. We get the word in us by absorbing it and reading it for ourselves. So please, I encourage you, get in the word. Jump into Philippians in Acts chapter 16, which is the context for where Philippians was written to. We love you. We're so excited that you are a part of this church family, that you are engaging with us. Quick reminder, next Sunday, August 7th, we have a membership meeting. If you're not yet a member of this body, and if you're not a member of a body, we want to encourage you, engage with this body. We want you to be a part of this church. We want you to join us. If you haven't yet come in person and you're in the area, come on out. Come out to church. We'd love to see you. We have people that love to greet you, seat you. And there's nothing quite like the corporate gathering of the believers. So I want to encourage you to do that. Have an amazing week. May God bless you. May he give you his favor upon you. May... May all the things that you need in your life, that you've been praying for, that you've been hope, putting your hope into, I pray that those things you have breakthrough. This week, in Jesus' name. Favor, 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 and blessing in Jesus' name. Have an awesome week. See you next time.